Welcome to Heavy Story Telling. Hi, Nick. Today we are going to your story. The reason why I haven't been clapping is because I have a notebook in my hand. Hello. Welcome to Heavy Story Telling. First up, we are going to be doing Bible verse with me. Mine. And then we're going to be reading the Bible, and then you're going to be doing stuff so that we're going to do the return of the king. Hope you guys enjoy it. Make sure to shoot the like button with your bow and arrow that you definitely have. And um, eat the subscribe button and pop the bell. I got the pop the bell from my dad. Hope you guys enjoy. Let's start things off. Okay. <laughs> that kind of hurt. <laughs> Micah 7, Micah 7, 7 through 8. Good verses, by the way. But, <clears throat> but as for me, I will look to the Lord. I will wait for God for my salvation. My God will hear me. Well, my God will hear me. Rejoice not over the over me oh my enemy when i fall i shall rise the lord will be a light to me that was the verses of the day and now it's daddy's turn to read all two chapters of the bible hope you guys enjoy here's my dad Hi, yes, we are reading two chapters today. Uh, we do, as I've said already, need to get through Acts so that we can bookend it by the end of the Return of the King. So we did start The Hobbit with the book of Luke, and we're going to end Return of the King with the book of Acts. So that is the plan. That was the plan from the beginning. And now let me... Just go ahead and get started. We are on Acts chapter 18. This is the English Standard Version. Let me begin. After this, Paul left Athens and went to Corinth. They aren't actually that far away. Chapter 18. Paul left Athens and went to Corinth. And uh, he found a Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontus, recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because Claudius had commanded all the Jews to leave Rome. And he went to see them, and because he was of the same trade, he stayed with them and worked, for they were tent makers by trade. And he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and tried to persuade Jews and Greeks. When Silas and Timothy arrived from Macedonia, Paul was occupied with the word testifying to the Jews that the Christ was Jesus. And when they opposed and reviled him, he shook out his garments and said to them, Your blood be on your own heads. I am innocent. From now on, I will go to the Gentiles." And he left there and went to the house of a man named Titius Justus, a worshiper of God. His house was next door to the synagogue. Crispus, the ruler of the synagogue, believed in the Lord together with his entire household. And many of the Corinthians, hearing Paul, believed and were baptized. And the Lord said to Paul one night in a vision, Do not be afraid, but go on speaking, and do not be silent, for I am with you, and no one will attack you to harm you, for I have many in this city who are my people. And he stayed a year and six months teaching the word of God among them. But when Gallio was proconsul of Achaia, the Jews made a united attack on Paul and brought him before the tribunal, saying, This man is persuading people to worship God contrary to the law. But when Paul was about to open his mouth, Gallio said to the Jews, If it were a matter of wrongdoing or vicious crime, O Jews, I would have reason to accept your complaint. But since it is a matter of questions about words and names and your own law, see to it yourselves. I refuse to be a judge of these things. And he drove them from the tribunal. 
And they all seized Sosthenes, the ruler of the synagogue, and beat him in front of the tribunal. But Gallio paid no attention to any of this. After this, Paul stayed many days longer and then took leave of the brothers and set sail for Syria, and with him Priscilla and Aquila. At Syncre, Syn, Syncre, he had cut his hair, for he was under a vow, and they came to Ephesus. And he left them there, but he himself went into the synagogue and reasoned with the Jews. When they asked him to stay for a longer period, he declined, but on talking... But on taking leave of them, he said, I will return to you if God wills. And he set sail from Ephesus. When he had landed in Caesarea, he went up and greeted the church and then went down to Antioch. After spending some time there, he departed and went from one place to the next through the region of Galatia and Phrygia, strengthening all the disciples. Now a Jew named Apollos, a native of Alexandria, came to Ephesus. He was an eloquent man, competent in the scriptures. He had been instructed in the way of the Lord, and being fervent in spirit, he spoke and taught accurately the things concerning Jesus, though he knew only the baptism of John. He began to speak boldly in the synagogue, but when Priscilla and Aquila heard him, they took him aside and explained to him the way of God more accurately. And when he he wished to cross to Achaia, the brothers encouraged him and wrote to the disciples to welcome, to welcome him. When he arrived, he greatly helped those who through grace had believed, for he powerfully refuted the Jews in public, showing by the scriptures that the Christ was Jesus. Chapter 19. Chapter 19. I just want to point out real quickly, Apollos, um, and he went to Achaia. It says he crossed to Achaia. That's because um, Ephesus is on the Asian continent in modern Turkey, um, on the very, very far west side. And then Achaia is the old-fashioned word for Greece, like the Achaeans. Um, and so that is on the other side of the um, the the ocean there. So, like, um, that is... Um, so that's where it says why it says crossing over to Apollos Achaia. Is a Jewish name? Apollos is not a Jewish name. Apollos is a Apollo, like the the Roman he god Apollo. Was a Jew. It does say he was a Jew. That's interesting. That would be something for further research, and I don't really have time for it now. I would like to point out, however, that I have my "I love you, Dad" sticky note uh, marked in this chapter. This is one of my favorite chapters. I don't know why. All right. So chapter 19. And it passed that while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul passed through the inland country and came to Ephesus. There he found some disciples and he said to them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? And they said, no, we have not even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. And he said, into what then were you baptized? They said, into John's baptism. And Paul said, John baptized with the baptism of repentance, telling the people to believe in the one who was to come after him, that is, Jesus. On hearing this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul had laid his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them, and they began speaking in tongues and prophesying. There were about twelve men in all. And he entered the synagogue and for three months spoke boldly, reasoning and persuading them about the kingdom of God. But when some became stubborn and continued in unbelief, speaking evil of the way before the congregation, he withdrew from them and took the disciples with him, reasoning daily in the hall of Tyrannus. This continued for two years, so that all the residents of Asia heard the word of the Lord, both Jews and and Greeks. And God was doing extraordinary miracles by the hands of Paul, so that even handkerchiefs or aprons that had touched his skin were carried away to the sick, and their diseases left them, and the evil spirits came out of them. Then some of the itinerant Jewish exorcists undertook to invoke the name of the Lord Jesus over those who had evil spirits, saying, I adjure you by by the Jesus whom Paul proclaims. Seven sons of a Jewish high priest named Sceva were doing this, but the evil spirit answered them, Jesus I know, and Paul I recognize, but who are you? 
And the man in whom was the evil spirit leapt on them, mastered all of them, and overpowered them, so that they fled out of that house naked and wounded. And this became known to all the residents of Ephesus, both Jews and Greeks. Is it raining? I think so. It just started raining crazy. It's really pouring outside. Both Jews and Greeks, and fear fell upon them all, and the name of the Lord Jesus was extolled. Also, many of those who were now believers came, confessing and divulging their practices. And a number of those who had practiced magic arts brought their books together and burned them in the sight of all. And they counted the value of them and found it came to 50,000 pieces of silver, which, by the way, is a lot of money. So the word of the Lord continued to increase and prevail mightily. Now, after these events, Paul resolved in the spirit to pass through Macedonia and Achaia and go to Jerusalem, saying, After I have been there, I must see also Rome. And having sent into Macedonia two of his helpers, Timothy and Erastus, he himself stayed in Asia for a while. About that time, there arose no little disturbance concerning the way, for a man named Demetrius, a silversmith, who made silver shrines of Artemis, brought no little business to the craftsmen. These he gathered together with the workmen in similar trades and said, Men, you know that from this business we have our wealth, and you see and hear, and not only in Ephesus, but in almost all of Asia, this Paul has persuaded and turned away a great many people, saying that gods made with hands are not gods. And there is a danger, not only that this trade of ours may come to disrepute, but also that the temple of the great goddess Artemis may be counted as nothing, and that she may even be deposed from her magnificence, she whom all Asia and the world worship. When they heard this, they were enraged and were crying out, Great is Artemis of the Ephesians! So the city was filled with confusion, with the confusion, and they rushed together into the theater, dragging with them Gaius and Aristarchus, Macedonians who were Paul's companions in travel. But when Paul wished to go in among the crowd, the disciples would not let him, and even some of the uh, Asiarchs, who were friends of his, sent to him and were urging him not to venture into the theater. So some cried out one thing, some another, for the assembly was in confusion, and most of them did not know what or why they had come together. Some of the crowd prompted Alexander, whom the Jews had put forward, and Alexander, motioning with his hand, wanted to make a defense to the crowd. But when they recognized that he was a Jew, for about two hours, they all cried out with one voice, Great is Artemis of the Ephesians! And when the town clerk had quieted the crowd, he said, Men of Ephesus, who is there who does not know that the city of the Ephesians is temple keeper of the great Artemis and of the sacred stone that fell from the sky? Seeing then that these things cannot be denied, you ought to be quiet and do nothing rash, for you have been brought you have brought these men here who are neither sacrilegious nor blasphemers of our goddess. If therefore Demetrius and the craftsmen with him have a complaint against any one, the courts are open, and there are proconsuls. Let them bring charges upon, against one another. But if you seek anything further, it shall be settled in the regular assembly. For we are in danger of being charged with rioting today, since there is no cause that we can give to justify this commotion. And when he had said these things, he dismissed the assembly. And we will finish that scene with chapter 20 tomorrow, and I hope that you're enjoying the reading of God's Word. So, obviously, um, on this very live stream, we have read that very story, which is told in Twice Freed, um, one of my favorites um, that we've had on this live stream. And also, one of the, um, it's the second most popular of the books that I've read, um, according to the number of YouTube views that have been um, that have been recorded. So now 
we're on to Return of the King. And so basically in the last chapter, um, Frodo, um, of course in chapter three, Frodo put on the ring. Um, then there was a big fight and Gollum um, wound up getting the ring from Frodo after he bit the, literally bit his finger off of his hand um, to get the ring. And in the process of all that, Gollum and the ring fell into the mountain and they were destroyed. Then and he, he jumped up and he was like, precious! And then he fell because he jumped too far. <laughs> okay, super. So anyway, um, however the details are of that, that's what happened in chapter 3. And um, after that happened in chapter 3, of course, Frodo and Sam were just exhausted beyond belief and they died in the mountain um, uh, quietly in their sleep because they were so exhausted and here's Kimberly to say what really happened <laughs> so um, Gandalf it cuts to Gandalf and they're in the middle of the fight and then suddenly the mountain starts shaking and then all the orcs are like, uh-oh, we better run. Because <laughs> the, the ring had just been destroyed, and they don't, they don't have a master anymore. And they don't have... Like, it's, it had a big theatric, um, like, few paragraphs about how... Um, something about how, like, the bravest of the orcs coward in fear because the driving hatred that the ring gave them just disappeared basically, in a second. Basically, um, they were orcs and now they are tadpoles. Now they're tadpoles. <laughs> so, um, then, then Gandalf, he looks up in the sky and he says, the eagles are coming! The eagles are coming! So, um, he goes over and talks to the, um, the king of the eagles, and he's like, hey, bring a few of your fastest eagles and take me over to the mountain because I think Frodo and Sam are there. So he go goes and gets Frodo and Sam, and they wake up in, um, in Gondor, I think. In Minas Tirith. Yeah. In Minas Tirith. I keep forgetting the name of Minas Tirith. Well, Gondor's <laughs> the country, Minas Tirith's I know. the city. I know. Um, so they were taken to Minas Tirith, and uh, they woke up. They'd been asleep for um, eight days. And, um... Eight days. Yeah, eight I know. Days. And another thing that happened was, uh, the day that the ring was destroyed is now the new year for Gondor. Yay! <laughs> and uh, I think that's about everything. There is an epic poem about uh, Frodo and Sam now, <laughs> so that's cool. I'm gonna hand it off to Dad, who's going to read a story. More of the story. So, what Kimberly missed was that Frodo and Sam got to go to the king, and. They didn't realize it until they got to him, and even when they saw him at first, they didn't recognize him, but it was Strider! And they said, it's Strider! And he said, yep, it's me. Who would have ever thunk it? All right, so, and he didn't exactly say those words, but close enough. All right, so we're, now we're on chapter five, the steward and the king. Let me begin. Over the city of Gondor, doubt and great dread had hung. Fair weather and clear sun had seemed but a mockery to men whose days held little hope and who looked each morning for news of doom. Their lord was dead and burned. Dead lay, on, dead lay the king of Rohan in their citadel, and the new king that had come to them in the night was gone again to a war with powers too dark and terrible for any might or valor to conquer. And no news came. After the host left Morgul Vale and took the northward road beneath the shadow of the mountains to 
uh, no messenger had returned, nor any rumor of what was passing in the brooding east. When the captains were but two days gone, the Lady Eowyn bade the women who tended her to bring her raiment, and she would not be gainsaid, but rose, and when they had clothed her and set her arm in a sling of linen, she went to the warden of the houses of healing. Sir, she said, I am in great unrest, and I cannot lie longer in sloth. Lady, he answered, you are not yet healed, and I was commanded to tend you with especial care. You should not have risen from your bed for seven days yet, or so I was bidden. I beg you to go back. I am healed, she said, healed at least in body, save my left arm only, and that is at ease. But I shall sicken anew if there is naught that I can do. Are there no riding, no tidings of war? The women can tell me nothing. There are no tidings, said the warden, save that the lords had ridden to Morgu Vale, and men say that the new captain out of the north is their chief. A great lord is that, and a healer, and it is a thing passing strange to me that the healing hand should also wield the sword. It is not thus in Gondor now, though once it was so, if old tales be true. But for long years we healers have only sought to patch the tents, patch the rents made by the men of swords, those we should still have enough to do without them. The world is full enough of hurts and mis mischances without wars to multiply them. It needs but one foe to breed a war, not two, Master Warden, answered Eowyn, and those who have no swords can still die upon them. Would you have the folk of Gondor gather you er herbs only when the Dark Lord gathers armies? And is it not always good to be healed in body, nor is it always evil to die in battle, even in bitter pain? Were I permitted in this dark hour, I would choose the latter." The warden looked at her. Tall she stood there, her eyes bright in her white face, her hand clenched as she turned and gazed out of his window that opened to the east. He sighed and shook his head. After a pause, she turned to him again. "'Is there no deed to do?' she said. "'Who commands in this city?' "'I do not rightly know,' he answered. "'Such things are not my care. "'There is a marshal over the riders of Rohan, "'and the Lord Huron, I am told, commands the men of Gondor. "'But the Lord Faramir is by right the steward of the city. "'Where can I find him?' "'In this house, my lady. "'He was sorely hurt and is now set again on the way to health. "'But I do not know. "'Will you not bring me to him? "'Then you will know.' The Lord Faramir was walking alone in the garden of the Houses of Healing, and the sunlight warmed him, and he felt life run anew in his veins, but his heart was heavy, and he looked out over the walls eastward, and coming, the warden spoke his name, and he turned and saw the Lady Eowyn of Rohan, and he was moved with pity, for he saw that she was hurt, and his clear sight perceived her sorrow and unrest." "'My lord,' said the warden, "'here is the Lady Eowyn of Rohan. "'She rode with the king and was sorely hurt "'and dwells now in my keeping. "'But she is not content, "'and she wishes to speak to the steward of the city.' "'Do not misunderstand him, my lord,' said Eowyn. "'It is not lack of care that grieves me. "'No houses could be fairer for those who desire to be healed. "'But I cannot lie in sloth, idle, caged. "'I look for death in battle.' But I have not died, and battle still goes on. At a sign from Faramir, the warden bowed and departed. What would you have me do, my lady? said Faramir. I also am a prisoner of the healers. He looked at her, and being a man whom pity deeply stirred, it seemed to him that her loveliness amid her grief would pierce his heart. And she looked at him and saw the grave tenderness in all in his eyes, and yet knew, for she was bred among men of war, that here was one whom no rider of the mark would outmatch in battle. What do you wish? he said again. If it lies in my power, I will do it. I would have you command this warden, and bid him let me go, she said, but though her words were still proud, her heart faltered, and for the first time she doubted herself. She guessed that this tall man, both stern and gentle, might think her merely wayward, like a child that has not 
the firmness of mind to go on with a dull task to the end. I myself am in the warden's keeping, answered Faramir, nor have I yet taken up my authority in the city, but had I done so, I should still listen to his counsel, and should not cross his will in matters of his craft, unless in some great need. But I do not desire healing, she said. I wish to ride to war like my brother Aylmer, or better, like Theoden the king, for he died, and has both honor and peace." "'It is too late, my lady, to follow the captains, even if you had the strength,' said Faramir. "'But death in battle may come to us all yet, willing or unwilling. "'You will be better prepared to face it in your own manner, "'if, while there is still time, you do as the healer commanded. "'You and I, we must endure with patience the hours of waiting.' She did not answer, but as she looked at her, as he looked at her, it seemed to him that something in her softened, softened, as though a bitter frost were yielding at the first faint presage of spring. A tear sprang in her eye and fell down her cheek like a glistening raindrop. Her proud head drooped a little, then quietly, more as if speaking to herself than to him. "'But the healers would have me lie abed seven days yet,' she said, "'and my window does not look eastward.' "'Her voice was now in that, that of a maiden, young and sad. "'Faramir smiled, though his heart was filled with pity. "'Your window does not look eastward,' he said. "'That can be amended. "'In this I will command the warden. "'If you will stay in this house in our care, my lady, "'and take your rest, then you shall walk in this garden in the sun, as you will, "'and you shall look east, whither all our hopes have gone, "'and there you will find me walking and waiting, and also looking east. "'It would ease my care if you would speak to me or walk at whiles with me.' Then she raised her head and looked him in the eyes again, and a color came in her pale face. How should I ease your care, my lord, she said, and I do not desire the speech of living men. Would you have my plain answer, he said, I would. Then, Eowyn of Rohan, I say to you that you are beautiful. In the valleys of our hills there are flowers fair and bright, and maidens fairer still, but neither flower nor lady have I seen till now in Gondor so lovely and so sorrowful. It may be that only a few days are left ere darkness falls upon the world, and when it comes I hope to face it steadily. But it would ease my heart if, while the sun yet shines, I could see you still. For you and I have both passed under the wings of the shadow, and the same hand drew us back. Alas, not me, Lord, she said. Shadow lies on me still. Look at... Look not to me for healing. I am a shield maiden, and my hand is ungentle. But I thank you for this, at least, that I need not keep to my chamber. I will walk abroad by the grace of the steward of the city. And she did him a cur courtesy and walked back to the house. It says courtesy, not curtsy. But Faramir for a long while walked alone in the garden, and his glance now strayed rather to the house than to the eastward walls. When he returned to his chamber, he called for the warden and heard all that he could, all that he could tell of the lady of Rohan. When, um, I just read that. But I doubt not, Lord, said the warden, that you would learn more from the halfling that is with us, for he was in the riding of the king, and with the lady in the end, they say. And so Mary was sent to Faramir, and while that day lasted, they talked long together, and Faramir learned much, more even than Mary put into words, and he thought that he understood now something of the grief and unrest of Eowyn of Rohan. And in the fair evening, Faramir and Mary walked in the garden, but she did not come. But in the morning, as Faramir came from the houses, he saw her as she stood upon the walls, and she was clad all in white and gleamed in the sun, and he called to her, and she came down, and they walked on the grass, or sat under a green tree together, now in silence, now in speech, and each day after they did likewise. And the warden, looking from his window, was glad in heart, for he was a healer, and his care was lightened, and certain it was that 
heavy as was the dread and foreboding of those days upon the hearts of men, still these two of his charges prospered and grew daily in strength. And so the fifth day came, since the Lady Eowyn went first to Faramir, and they stood now together once more upon the walls of the city and looked out. No tidings had yet come, and all hearts were darkened. The weather, too, was bright no longer. It was cold. A wind that had sprung up in the night was blowing now keenly from the north, and it was rising, but the lands about looked gray and drear. They were clad in warm raiment and heavy cloaks, and over all the Lady Eowyn wore a great blue mantle of the color of deep summer night, and it was set with silver stars about hem and throat. Faramir had sent for this robe and had wrapped it about her, and he thought that she looked fair and queenly indeed as she stood there at his side. The mantle was wrought for his mother, Finduilis, of Amroth, who died untimely, and was to him but a memory of loveliness in far days, and of his first grief, and her robe seemed to him raiment fitting for the beauty and sadness of Eowyn. But she now shivered beneath the starry mantle, and she looked northward above the gray hitherlands, into the eye of the cold wind, where far away the sky was hard and clear. "'What do you look for, Eowyn?' said Faramir. "'Does not the black gate lie yonder?' said she. "'And must he not now be come thither? "'It is seven days since he rode away.' Seven days,' said Faramir. "'But think not ill of me, if I say to you, "'they have brought me both a joy and a pain "'that I never thought to know. "'Joy to see you, but pain, "'because now the fear and doubt of this evil time "'are grown dark indeed, Eowyn. "'I would not have this world end now, "'or lose so soon that I have found what I have found.' "'Lose what you have found, my lord,' she answered. "'But she looked at him gravely, and her eyes were kind. "'I know not what in these days you have found that you could lose. "'But come, my friend, let us not speak of it. "'Let us not speak at all. "'I stand upon some dreadful brink, "'and it is utterly dark in the abyss before my feet. "'But whether there is any light behind me, I cannot tell, "'for I cannot turn yet. "'I wait for some stroke of doom.' Yes, we wait for the stroke of doom, said Faramir, and they said no more, and it seemed to them as they stood upon the wall that the wind died, and the light failed, and the sun was bleared, and all sounds in the city or in the lands about were hushed, neither wind nor voice nor bird call nor rustle of leaf nor their own breath could be heard. The very beating of their hearts was stilled. Time halted. And as they stood as they stood so, their hands met and clasped, though they did not know it, and still they waited, for they knew not what. Then presently it seemed to them that above the ridges of the distant mountains mountains, another vast mountain of darkness rose, towering up like a wave that should engulf the world, and about it lightnings flickered, and then a tremor ran through the earth, and then they felt the walls of the city quiver. A sound like a sigh went up from all the lands about them, and their hearts beat suddenly again. It reminds me of Numenor, said Faramir, and wondered to hear himself speak. "'Of Numenor,' said Eowyn. "'Yes,' said Faramir, "'of the land of Westerness that foundered, "'and the great dark that, uh, dark wave climbing over the green lands "'and above the hills and coming on, darkness unescapable. "'I often dream of it.' "'Then you think that the darkness is coming,' said Eowyn. "'Darkness unescapable?' "'And suddenly she drew close to him. "'No,' said Faramir, looking into her face. "'It was but a picture in the mind. "'I do not know what is happening. "'The reason of my waking mind tells me "'that great evil has befallen, "'and we stand at the end of days. "'But my heart says nay, "'and all my limbs are light, "'and my hope and joy are come to me "'that no reason can deny. "'Eowyn, Eowyn, white lady of Rohan, "'in this hour I do not believe "'that any darkness will endure.' And he stooped and kissed her brow. And so they stood on the walls of the city of Gondor, and a great wind rose and blew, and their hair raven 
and golden streamed out mingling in the air, and the shadow departed, and the sun was unveiled, and light leapt forth, and the waters of Anduin shone like silver, and in all the houses of the city men sang for joy that welled up in their hearts for from what source they could not tell. And before the sun had fallen far from the noon out of the east, there came a great eagle flying, and he bore tidings beyond hope from the lords of the west, crying, Sing now, ye people of the Tower of Anor, for the realm of Sauron is ended forever, and the dark tower is thrown down. Sing and rejoice, ye people of the Tower of Garod, for Tower of Guard, Gosh. Garod. I don't know. <laughs> For your watch hath not been in vain, and the black gate is broken, and your king hath passed through, and he is victorious. Sing and be glad, all ye children of the West, for your king shall come again, and he shall dwell among you all the days of your life. And the tree that was withered shall be renewed, and he shall plant it in the high places, and the city shall be blessed. Sing, all ye people. And the people sang in all the ways of the city. The days that followed were golden, and spring and summer joined and made revel together in the fields of Gondor. And tidings now came by swift riders from Caer Andros, of all that was done, and the city made ready for the coming of the king. Mary was summoned and rode away with the wains that took store of the goods to Osgiliath, and thence by ship to Ker Andros. But Faramir did not go, for now being healed, he took upon him the authority, his authority, and the stewardship, although it was only for a little while, and his duty was to prepare for one who should replace him. And Eowyn did not go, though her brother sent word begging her to come to the field of Cormallan, and Faramir wondered at this, but he saw her seldom being busy with many matters, and she dwelt still in the houses of healing, and walked alone in the garden, and her face grew pale again, and it seemed that in all the city she only was ailing and sorrowful, and the warden of the houses was troubled, and he spoke to Faramir. Then Faramir came and sought her, and once more more they stood on the walls together and he said to her Eowyn why do you tarry here and do not go to the rejoicing in Cormallan beyond Ker Andros where your brother awaits you and she said did you not know but he answered two reasons there may be but which is true I do not know and she said I do not wish to play at riddles speak plainer then if you will have it so, lady, he said, you do not go, because only your brother called for you, and to look on the Lord Aragorn, Elendil's heir in his triumph, would now bring you no joy, or because I do not go, and you desire still to be near me, and maybe for both these reasons, and you yourself cannot choose between them. Eowyn, do you not love me, or will you not? I wish to be loved by another, she answered, but, my, but I desire no man's pity. That I know, he said. You desired to have the love of the Lord Aragorn, because he was high and puissant, and you wished, wished to have renown and glory, and to be lifted far above the mean things that crawl upon the earth. And as a great captain may to a young soldier, he seemed to you admirable. For so he is, a lord among men, the greatest that now is. But when he gave you only understanding and pity, then you desired to have nothing unless a brave death in battle. Look at me, Eowyn. And Eowyn looked at Faramir long and steadily. And Faramir said, Do not scorn pity that is the gift of a gentle heart, Eowyn. But I do not offer you my pity, for you are a lady high and valiant, and have yourself one renown that shall not be forgotten. And you are a lady beautiful, I deem, beyond even the words of the elven tongue to tell. And I love you. Once I pitied your sorrow, but now were you sorrowless without fear or any lack, were you the blissful queen of Gondor, still I would love you. Eowyn, do you not love me? 
Then the heart of Eowyn changed, or else at last she understood it, and suddenly her winter passed and the sun shone on her. I stand in Minas Anor, the Tower of the Sun, she said, and behold, the shadow has departed. I will be a shield maiden no longer, nor vie with the great riders, nor make nor take joy only in the songs of slaying. I will be a healer and love all things that grow and are not barren. And again she looked at Faramir. No longer do I desire to be a queen, she said. Then Faramir laughed merrily. That is well, he said, for I am not a king. Yet I will wed with a white lady of Rohan, if it be her will. And if she will, then let us cross the river, and in happier days let us dwell in fair Ithilien, and there make a garden. All things will grow with joy there, if the white lady comes. Then must I leave my own people, man of Gondor, she said, and would you have your proud folk say of you, there goes a lord who tamed a wild shield maiden of the north. Was there no woman of the race of Numenor to choose? I would, said Faramir, and he took her in his arms and kissed her under the sunlit sky, and he cared not that that they stood high upon the walls in the sight of many, and many indeed saw them and the light that shone about them as they came down from the walls and went hand in hand to the houses of healing. And to the warden of the houses, Faramir said, Here is the Lady Eowyn of Rohan, and now she is healed. And the warden said, Then I release her from my charge and bid her farewell. And may she suffer never hurt nor sickness again. I commend her to the care of the steward of the city until until her brother returns. But Eowyn said, Yet now that I have leave to depart, I would remain, for this house has become to me of all dwellings the most blessed. And she remained there until King Eomer came. All things were now made ready in the city, and there was great concourse of people, for the tidings had gone about had gone out into all parts of Gondor, from Min Rimon even to Pinath Gilin, and the far coasts of the sea, and all that would, that could come to the city made haste to come. And the city was filled again with women and fair children that returned to their homes laden with flowers, and from Dol Amroth came the harpers that harped most skillfully in all the land, and there were players upon viols and upon flutes and upon horns of silver, and clear-voiced singers from the vales of Lebanon. At last an evening came when from the walls the pavilions could be seen upon the field, and all night lights were burning as men watched for the dawn. And when the sun rose in the clear morning above the mountains of the east, upon which shadows lay no more, then all the bells rang, and all the banners broke, and flowed in the wind, and upon the white tower of the citadel, the standard of the stewards, bright argent like snow in the sun, bearing no charge nor device, was raised over Gondor for the last time. Now the captains of the west led their host toward the city, and folk saw them advance in line upon line, flashing and glinting in the sunrise and rippling like silver. And so they came before the gateway and halted a furlong from the walls. And yet no gates had been set again, but the barrier was laid across the entrance to the city. And there stood men at arms in silver and black with long swords drawn. Before the barrier stood Faramir the steward, and Huron, warden of the keys, and other captains of Gondor, and the Lady Eowyn of Rohan, with Elfhelm the marshal, and many knights of the mark. And upon either side of the gate was a great press of fair people, in raiment of many colors and garlands of flowers." So now there was a wide space before the walls of Minas Tirith, and it was hemmed in upon all sides by the knights and the soldiers of Gondor and of Rohan, and by the people of the city and of all parts of the land. A hush fell upon all, as out from the host stepped the Dunedain in silver and gray, and before them came walking slow 
the Lord Aragorn. He was clad in black mail girt with silver, and he wore a long mantle of pure white clasped at the throat with a great jewel of green that shone from afar, but his head was bare save for a star upon his forehead bound by a slender fillet of silver. With him were Aomer of Rohan, and the prince Imrahil, and Gandalf robed all in white, and four small figures that many men marveled to see. "'Nay, cousin, they are not boys,' said Eorith to her kinswoman from Imloth uh, Melui, who stood beside her. "'Those are Perean, out of the far country of the halflings, where they are princes of great fame, it is said. I should know, for I had once to tend in the houses. They are small, but they are valiant. Why, cousin, one of them went with only his esquire into the black country, and fought with the dark lord all by himself, and set fire to his tower, if you can believe it. At least that is the tale in the city." That will be the one that walks with our Elfstone. They are dear friends, I hear. Now he is a marvel, the Lord Elfstone. Not too soft in his speech, mind you, but he has a golden heart, as the saying is, and he has the healing hands. The hands of the king are the hands of a healer, I said, and that was how it was all discovered. And Mithrandir, he said to me, Eorith, men will long remember your words, and... But Eorth was not permitted to continue the instruction to her kinswoman from her country, for a single trumpet rang, and a dead silence followed. Then forth from the gate went Faramir with Hur Huron of the Keys, and no others save that behind them walked four men in the high helms and armor of the citadel, and they bore a great casket of black Lebrathon, Lebethron bound with silver whatever Lebethron is, bound with silver. Faramir met Aragorn in the midst of those there assembled, and he knelt and said, The last steward of Gondor begs leave to surrender his office. And he held out a white rod, but Aragorn took the rod and gave it back, saying, That office is not ended, and it shall be thine and thy heirs, as long as my line shall last. Do now thy office. Then Faramir stood up and spoke in a clear voice. Men of Gondor, hear now the steward of this realm. Behold, one has come to claim the kingship again at last. Here is Aragorn, son of Arathorn, chieftain of the Dunedain of Arnor, captain of the host of the west, bearer of the star of the north, wielder of the sword Regfort, sorry, sword reforged, victorious in battle, whose hands bring healing, the elf stone, Elisar of the line of Valandil, Isildur's son, Elendil's son of Numenor. Shall he be king and enter into the city and dwell there? And all the host and all the people cried, Yea, with one voice. And Eorath said to her kinswoman, This is just a ceremony such as we have in the city, cousin, for he has already entered, as I was telling you. And he said to me, and then again she was obliged to silence, for Faramir spoke again. Men of Gondor, the lore masters tell that it was the custom of old that the king should receive the crown from his father ere he died, or if that might not be, that he should go alone and take it from the hands of his father in the tomb where he was laid. But since things must now be done otherwise, using the authority of the steward, I have today brought hither from Rath Dinen the crown of Inner, the last king whose day Days passed in the time of our long fathers of old. Then the guard stepped forward, and Faramir opened the casket, and he held up an ancient crown. It was shaped like the helms of the guards of the citadel, save that it was loftier, and it was all white, and the wings at either side were wrought of pearl and silver in the likeness of the wings of a seabird, for it was the emblem of kings who came over the sea, and seven gems of adamant were set in the circlet, and upon it 
its summit was set a single jewel, the light of which went up like a flame. Then Aragorn took the crown and held it up and said, Oh no, this is an elvish. <laughs> <sighs> Et Irello Endorena Utulian Sinome Maruvan Ar Hildanyar Ten Ambar Meta. That one wasn't so bad. And those were the words that Elendil spoke when he came up out of the sea on the wings of the wind. Out of the great sea to Middle Earth I am come. In this place will I abide and my heirs unto the ending of the world. Then, to the wonder of many, Aragorn did not put the crown upon his head, but gave it back to Faramir and said, by the labor and valor of many, I have come into my inheritance. In token of this, I would have the ring-bearer bring the crown to me, and let Mithrandir lay it, uh, set it upon my head, if he will. For he has been the mover of all that has been accomplished, and this is his victory. Then Frodo came forward and took the crown from Faramir and bore it to Gandalf, and Aragorn knelt, and Gandalf set the white crown upon his head and said, Now come the days of the king, and may they be blessed while the thrones of the Valar endure. But when Aragorn arose, all that beheld him gazed in silence, for it seemed to them that he was revealed to them now for the first time. Tall as the sea kings of old, he stood above all that were near, ancient of days he seemed, and yet in the, ma in the flower of manhood and wisdom sat upon his brow, and strength and healing were in his hands, and a light was about him, and then Faramir cried, Behold, the king! And in that moment all the trumpets were blown, and the king Elisar went forth and came to the barrier, and Huron of the keys thrust it back, and amid the music of harp and of viol and of flute and the singing of clear voices, the king passed through the flower-laden streets and came to the citadel and entered in, and the banner of the tree and the stars was unfurled upon the topmost tower, and the reign of King Elisar began, of which many songs have told. In his time the city was made more fair than it had ever been, even in the days of its first glory, and it was filled with trees and with fountains, and its gates were wrought with myth mithril and steel, and its streets were paved with white marble, and the folk of the mountain labored in it, and the folk of the wood rejoiced to come there, and all was healed and made good, and the houses were filled with men and women and the laughter of children, and no window was blind nor any courtyard empty. And after the ending of the third age of the world, into the new age it preserved the memory and the glory of the years that were gone. In the days that followed his crowning, the king sat on his throne in the hall of the kings and pronounced his judgments, and embassies came from many lands and peoples, from the east and the south, and from the borders of Mirkwood, and from Dunland in the west, and the king pardoned the Easterlings that had given themselves up and sent them away free, and he made peace with the peoples of Harad, and the slaves of Mordor he released and gave to them all the lands about Lake Nurnen to be their own, and there were brought before him many to receive his praise and reward for their valor. And last, the captain of the guard brought to him Baragon to be judged, or that might be the captain of the Gerod, I'm not sure. And the king said to Baragond, Baragond, by your sword, blood was spilled in the hallows where that is forbidden. Also, you left your post without leave of lord or of captain. For these things of old, death was the penalty. Now, therefore, I must pronounce your doom. All penalty is remitted for your valor in battle, and still more because all that you did was for the love of the Lord Faramir. Nevertheless, you must leave the guard of the citadel, and you must go forth from the city of Minas Tirith. 
Then the blood left Baragon's face, and he was stricken to the heart, and bowed his head. But the king said, So it must be, for you are appointed to the white company, the guard of Faramir, prince of Ithilien, and you shall be its captain, and dwell in Emin Arnon in honor and peace, and in the service of him for whom you risked it all to save him from death. And then Baragon, perceiving the mercy and justice of the king, was glad, and kneeling, kissed his hand, and departed in joy and content. And Aragorn gave to Faramir Ithilien to be his princedom, and bade him dwell in the hills of Emin Arnen within sight of the city. For, he said, Minas Ithil in Morguvil shall be utterly destroyed, and though it may in time to come be made clean, no man may dwell there for many long years. And last of all, Aragorn greeted Eomer of Rohan, and they embraced. And Aragorn said, Between us there can be no word of giving or taking, excuse me, nor of reward, for we are brethren. In happy hour did Eorl ride from the north, and never has any league of people been more blessed, so that neither has ever failed the other, nor shall fail. Now, as you know, we have laid Theoden the renowned in the tomb of the hollows, and there he shall lie for ever among the kings of Gondor, if you will. Or, if you desire it, we will come to Rohan and bring him back to rest with his own people. And Eomer answered, Since the day when you rose before me out of the green grass of the downs, I have loved you, and that love shall not fail. But now I must depart for a while to my own realm, where there is much to heal and set in order. But as for the fallen, when all is made ready, we will return for him, but here let him sleep for a while. And Eowyn said to Faramir, Now I must go back to my own land, and look on it once again, and help my brother in his labor. But when one whom I love, I long loved as father is laid at last to rest, I will return. So the glad days passed, and on the eighth day of May the riders of Rohan made ready, and rode off by the north way, and with them went the sons of Elrond. All the road was lined with people to do them honor and praise them, from the gate of the city to the walls of the Pelennor. Then all others that dwelt that dwelt afar, went back to their homes rejoicing. But in the city there was labor of many willing hands to rebuild and renew and to remove all the scars of war and the memory of the darkness. The hobbit still remained in Minas Tirith with Legolas and Gimli, for Aragorn was loth for the fellowship to be dissolved. At last, for such things must end, he said, but I would have you wait a little while longer." For the end of the deeds that you have shared in has not, co- has not yet come. A day draws near that I have looked for in all the years of my manhood, and when it comes I would have my friends beside me. But of that day he would say no more. In those days the companions of the ring dwelt together in a fair house with Gandalf, and they went to and fro as they wished, and Frodo said to Gandalf, Do you know that this is the day that Aragorn speaks of? For we are happy here, and I don't wish to go, but the days are running away, and Bilbo is waiting, and the Shire is my home. As for Bilbo, said Gandalf, he is waiting for the same day, and he knows what keeps you. And as for the passing of the days, it is now only May, and high summer is not yet in, and though all things may seem changed as if an age of the world had gone by, yet to the trees and the grass it is less than a year since you set out. Pippin, said Frodo, didn't you say that Gandalf was less close than of old? Less close than of old, whatever that means. He was weary of his labors then, I think, Now he is recovering. And Gandalf said, Many folk like to know beforehand what is to be set on the table, for those who have labored to prepare the feast like to keep their secret, for wonder makes the the words of praise louder, and Aragorn himself waits for a sign. 
there came a day when Gandalf could not be found, and the companions wondered what was going forward. But Gandalf took Aragorn out from the city by night, and he brought him to the southern feet of Mount Mindoluin, and there they found a path made in ages past that few now dared to tread, for it it led up on to the mountain to a high hollow where only the kings had been wont to go. And they, they went up by steep ways until they came to a high field below the snows that clad the lofty peaks. And it looked down over the precipice that stood between, sorry, stood behind the city. And standing there, they surveyed the lands. For the morning was come, and they saw the towers of the city far below them like white pencils touched by the sunlight, and all the vale of Anduin was like a garden, and the mountains of shadow were veiled in a golden mist. Upon the one side their sight reached to the grey Emin Muil, and the glint of Raurus was like a star twinkling off, and upon the other side they saw the river like a ribbon laid down to Pelagir, and beyond that was the light on the hem of the sky that spoke of the sea. And Gandalf said, This is your realm. And the heart of the greener realm that shall be. The third age of the world is ended, and the new age is begun. And it is your task to order its beginning and to preserve it what may be preserved. For though much has been saved, much now must pass away. And the power of the, of the three rings also is ended. And all the lands that you see and those that lie around about them shall be dwellings of men for the time comes of the dominion of men and the elder kindred shall fade or depart i know it well dear friend said aragorn but i would still have your counsel not for long now said gandalf the third age was my age i was the enemy of sauron and my work is finished i shall go soon the burden must now lie upon you and your kindred. But I shall die, said Aragorn, for I am a mortal man, and though being what I am, and of the race of the West unmingled, I shall have life far longer than other men, yet that is but a little while. And when those who are now in the wombs of women are born and have grown old, I too shall grow old. And who then shall govern Gondor and those who look to this city and to their queen if my desire be not granted? The tree in the court of the fountain is still withered and barren. When shall I see a sign that it will ever be otherwise? "'Turn your face from the green world and look where all seems barren and cold,' said Gandalf. Then Aragorn turned, and there was a stony slope behind him running down from the skirts of the snow, and as he looked, he was aware that alone there in the waste a growing, thring, a growing thing stood. And he climbed to it and saw that out of the very edge of the snow there sprang a sapling tree no more than three foot high. Already it had put forth young leaves long and shapely, dark above and silver beneath, and upon its slender crown it bore one small cluster of flowers whose white petals shone like the sunlit snow. Then Aragorn cried, "'Yea!' Utu Vinyes, I have found it. Lo, here is a scion of the eldest of trees. But how comes it here? For it is not itself yet seven years old. And Gandalf, coming, looked at it and said, Verily, this is a sapling of the line of Nimloth the fair, and that was a seedling of Galathilion, and that a fruit of Ter... Telperion of many names, eldest of trees, who shall say how it comes here in the appointed hour? But thus is an ancient hollow, and ere the kings failed or the tree withered in the court, a fruit must have been set here. For it is said that though the fruit in the tree comes seldom to ripeness, yet the life within may then lie sleeping, though many through many long years, and none can foretell the time in which it will awake. 
Remember this, for if ever a fruit ripens, it should be planted, lest the line die out of the world. Here it has lain hidden on the mountain, even as the race of Elendil lay hidden in the wastes of the north. Yet the line of Nimloth is older far than your line, King Elisar. Then Aragorn laid his head his hand gently to the sapling, and lo, it seemed to hold only lightly to the earth, and it was removed without hurt, and Aragorn bore it back to the citadel. Then he withered the withered tree was uprooted, but with reverence, and they did not burn it, but laid it to rest in the silence of Rathdinen, and Aragorn planted the new tree on the on the court by the fountain, and swiftly and gladly it began to grow, and when the month of June entered in it, was laden with blossom. The sign has been given, said Aragorn, and the day is not far off, and he set watchmen upon the walls. It was the day before midsummer when messengers came from Amundin to the city, and they said that there was a riding of fair folk out of the north, and they drew near now to the walls of the Pelennor, and the king said, At last they have come. Let all the city be made ready. Upon the very eve of midsummer, when the sky was blue as sapphire and white stars opened in the east, but the west was still golden and the air was cool and fragrant, the riders came down the north way to the gates of Minas Tirith. First rode El, El Rohir and Eladan with a banner of silver, and then came Glorfindel and Aristor and all the household of Rivendell, and after them came the Lady Galadriel and Cer Celeborn, Lord of Lothlorien, riding upon white steeds, and with them many fair folk of their land, grey-cloaked, with white gems in their hair, and last came Master Elrond, mighty among elves and men, bearing the scepter of Anum... Anuminus, and beside him, upon a grey palfrey, rode Arwen, his daughter, even star of her people. And Frodo, when he saw her, come glimmering in the evening with stars on her brow, and with a sweet fragrance about her, was moved with great wonder. And he said to Gandalf, At last I understand why we have waited. This is the ending. Now not now not day only shall be beloved, but night too shall be bare, uh, shall be beautiful and blessed, and all its fear pass away. Then the king welcomed his guests, and they alighted, and Elrond surrendered the scepter, and laid the hand of his daughter in the hand of the king, and together they went up into the high city, and all the stars flowered in the sky, and Aragorn the king Elisar wedded Arwen Undomiel in the city of the kings upon the day of midsummer, and the tale of their long waiting and labors was come to fulfillment. And that is the end of chapter five. And we will begin chapter six tomorrow or on the next day if we're not able to do it after Awana's. Um, here is a picture. It looks just like a church. So, all right. Guess what? I made cookies. Kimmy I made, made cookies today. Kimmy made <laughs> cookies today. All right. So chapter six is called Many Partings. And once again, the ending is beginning. And once again, we're waiting. <laughs> and um, we... Wedding, we yeah. Um... So when I read this the first time, I did not understand um, Aragorn and Arwen. That didn't make sense to me. And for that purpose, we will be reading some, not all, of the appendices. I say some of because um, some of the appendices are literally just like genealogy, like family trees or whatever. And like you can't really read that. Um, it's kind of interesting reference material, but not really readable but we will definitely be reading the, I believe it's called The Romance of Aragorn and Arwen or something like that. Um, so anyway, uh, without further ado, I'm going to bid you farewell. Hope you're having a great evening. God bless you, and we'll see you again next time.